Father, we do thank you for your word. We would be lost if it wasn't for your word. As we have just been singing, you lead us. You show us the way to go. And the way that we know you're leading is through your word to us. And so we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing that it is to us, the blessing that it is to the world. And we ask that these verses from Psalm 20 would touch our hearts and our minds and our lives today in a new and fresh way. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. How many of you have ever been to the dentist? Our children uh, had sealants put on their teeth, and so for our children, going to the dentist isn't the big deal that it is for me. But I, uh, I do not have great teeth, and so I've been to the dentist a lot. A, a couple years ago, I went to the dentist 11 out of 12 months. And I have to tell you something about going to the dentist. When I look at a month ahead... And I see that one day I have to spend an hour in the dentist chair. I start to dread that day at the beginning of the month. And I have a great dentist. I receive great dental care. I am numbed of the pain of the dentist, but it still is something that causes some stress in my life as I look ahead and have to go to the dentist. All of us can look ahead and see events in our lives that concern us, that maybe they cause us angst, maybe they cause us some consternation. And we have uh, with us today in this room everybody who is a part of Calvary Church, including our children, and even you as children, as kids, you can look ahead and see some things that you dread, some things that cause you some stress. I would rather that day not come, but the day inevitably does come. Whether you're six or 96, we all look ahead and see some things that we really don't want to happen. Now, if you for a moment think that you are a part of a generation of people on earth who are the only people who have ever had some angst and stress in your life, I want you to make sure that you remember Psalm 20. As we look at this psalm, we are remembering that 3,000 years ago, people still had angst and still had stress in their lives. Uh, they didn't have the things that we have today. They didn't have uh, bathrooms with running water. Their air was not conditioned and cooled. Uh, they did not live like us, but they still had angst and stress. And there's a, there's a background to Psalm 20. And the background is this. If you lived in a nation that had any degree of safety, you were safe because there was a king ruling over that nation with a big army to back him up and keep the nation safe. And if that king had to go and fight another nation, that created all kinds of stress in your life. Because if the king and the army lost that battle, it was likely that you were going to be a slave until another king could come and free you. And so when kings had to go to battle, there was a huge degree of stress that was a part of the lives of the people in that nation. And so that's probably the context of Psalm 20. In Israel, there was probably an upcoming battle David may have been the king who was involved in that battle. And so the people are preparing for that battle. Uh, there's a real easy outline to this psalm. Uh, as you look at these sections, verses 1 to 5, uh, the people are asking God for success in the life of their king. Verses 6 to 8, the people are expressing confidence in God. And then verse 9, 
are, are some closing words to God. And the question comes, as we are living here in 2019, taking a look at something that is 3,000 years old, some words that were written 3,000 years ago, and yet the truth of God, how do we live these words out? And how are we supposed to grab value from these words of God written so long ago? Well, first of all, we can pray as we look ahead and see potential trouble in our lives. We can pray for ourselves. We can pray for others. We can pray for our church. We can pray for our country. The people of Israel were praying for victory for their king. They looked ahead. They saw a battle, and they saw that that battle might cause all kinds of disruption in their lives. And so they did the main thing that any people of God can do. They prayed. May the Lord answer you in the day of your trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help and give you support. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. As we look at that psalm and again try to apply it, the people of God looked ahead. They saw an event that was a big event that could change their lives, and they prayed. But we also read that they made offerings, and they gave to God burnt sacrifices. Uh, were the people of Israel at this time sort of practicing a little bit of the health and wealth gospel? Were they trying to sort of uh, make sure that God really listened to them by giving him these special offerings? Uh, no, uh, they were doing what God had commanded them. God told the people of Israel, as you face life, as you are looking at circumstances, here's how I want you to live. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to offer these sacrifices at this time. I want you to do this. These people believed their God was faithful. They believed that their God kept the covenant, the promise that he made to them. And so they did what he told them to do. They wanted to honor him. Uh, may he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Uh, there, there's a shift in the last part of this first section as there's this positive look at the future. May we shout for joy. May we put our banners up. Um, we have some banners up in our uh, sanctuary that we worship in here, this gymnasium. And the, the banners have words on them that we believe are important. And I think we have, I don't know, four or five sets of banners, and we put them up throughout the year to give a different emphasis uh, but in the days of the Old Testament, in these days of the psalm that was written, uh, banners signified victory. The king wins. The king is victorious. And the people of God looked ahead to victory as they were praying for their king. Now, we're at a different time in history. We are living after the life of and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, as we pray, we can pray with a different kind of confidence. We can pray because the greatest victory that has ever been achieved has already been achieved by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has won the biggest victory. He has achieved victory over death. And so as we pray, we can pray in a different way because we know the ultimate outcome of the world and the ultimate outcome of world history. As we have uh, all of our children with us this morning, I wanted to share a, a story from a couple years ago. We have always had outstanding students who've been a part of the Calvary Church family. 
And a couple of years ago, I was talking to a student who was heading into finals week. And this particular student happened to be in high school. And finals week can be a stressful time. And I was talking to this uh, student and I asked them about finals and they sort of yawned. And I thought, hmm, that's, that's a little different. And they informed me that they had worked so hard and they had done so well in this class that basically the only thing that they needed to make sure of on the final exam was that they put their name on the top of it. And they, they were still going to get an A. And I thought, that would have been a nice thing to go through when I was a student. <laughs> uh, I never had that luxury. But that is kind of like it is for us as we pray. There is this greatest victory that Christ has already achieved, and we know the outcome of our lives. We know that as His people, we're going to go and to be with Him forever. We can pray with confidence as we look ahead and see even potential trouble in our lives. A second way that we can take this psalm is we can look at that second section, verses 6 to 8. We can stand in true trust. Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He will answer Him from His holy heaven with the saving might of His right hand. In Psalm 20, there have been, been, there have been people praying for their king's success and there's a shift as they begin to speak about this king in verse 6. They believe that their king is anointed. That word anointed isn't a word that we see out in the everyday world. At least I don't see it outside of uh, these walls very often. And in the Bible, the word anointed, especially in the Old Testament has some key elements to it that I wanted to just share with you briefly this morning. Um, it holds the idea of uh, pouring oil over something or someone. And the idea behind that, first of all, is to set that item apart for special use. And so a person who has been anointed may have literally had a group of people gather around them and pour some oil over their head to set them apart for a special use. Uh, kings of Israel were set apart in this way. And it was a way of people saying, you're a special person. Uh, secondly, God empowers these people to do a specific task. Thirdly, nobody was allowed to harm God's anointed. And so the kings of Israel were honored and guarded because they were God's anointed. Finally, the Messiah who was to come was the ultimate one who was anointed. And Jesus was described in Acts as being anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. Uh, next week, uh, the Kelly family is going to be here. And many of you may know the Kellys. If you don't, just tell you briefly, they are missionaries to Hungary. And Jen Kelly grew up in this church. And next week, we're going to have a group of people gather around and pray for them. We aren't calling this an anointing, but it is kind of an anointing because we are saying, God, we dedicate these people to you. We believe that they have a special purpose to fulfill in the world. And we believe that you will give them everything they need to do this thing that you have called them to do. As the people of Israel looked at their king, they looked at him as God's anointed the one that God had placed there for this special purpose. The seventh verse of this chapter is a verse that I memorized many years ago. It's a favorite verse of mine. 
It's one that I often use in prayer. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. As I was preparing several weeks ago for today's message, I was trying to think of some ways that I could read this verse that might grab more attention. Some trust in Trump and some Pelosi, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. That might have grabbed us. Some trust in money, some trust in Wall Street, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in school, some trust in education, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Uh, Why use horses and chariots? Well, 3,000 years ago, chariots and horses were the most powerful military tools that were available. You had two horses and two soldiers and an iron chariot, and it basically was like a mobile firing platform. And those armies that had iron chariots were really powerful armies. The more chariots, the more powerful. But one of the things that is significant is the second half of Psalm Psalm 20, verse 7. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. The problem with human resources, like a chariot, is that even the most powerful human resources can have some things happen to them that neutralize them. Even the people of God at the time this psalm was written, remember something about chariots. There's a whole bunch of them at the bottom of the Red Sea. People of this time remember Joshua 11, a surprise attack neutralized an army that had all kinds of chariots in Joshua chapter 11. There's a story in the book of Judges about Uh, an evil king by the name of Jabin who had 900 iron chariots and they were prepared to destroy the nation of Israel. But a thunderstorm came and these 900 chariots were bogged down in mud and they were worthless. And so even in the days that this psalm was written, there was an understanding that even the most powerful human resources can fail. As you move into modern times, you can see examples even in our lifetime. In 1941, there were all sorts of military things housed at Pearl Harbor. But a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor neutralized all of the power that was there. All the military might was neutralized by a sneak attack. Uh, The Germans were very successful because they had tanks. But as they sought to seek, or as they sought to attack Russia, the temperatures got to 30 and 40 below zero, and their fuel froze, and a tank is no good with no fuel. And so the tanks were neutralized, and Germany was not successful. As we look at human resources, we see that They can be destroyed and neutralized. Being a human being who follows Jesus Christ is a lifelong adventure, learning to place our complete trust in God and not artificial supports. A few days ago, I was in the home of Paul and Renee Jash. And Paul was in the process of breathing his last breaths here on earth. And I began to think as I drove away from that home that Paul had benefited a great deal over the years from medical science. He was able to live 60 years because of some great people and some great discoveries in the field of medicine. Technology helped Paul a great deal these last several years. Uh, Paul was a part of the military early in his life, and the military 
served Paul to a great extent in that Paul lived in this country and was safe his entire life, never had to fend off uh, troops from other nations because our military was strong and kept our nation safe. Paul benefited from a solid economy here in America. He was able to buy and live in a home and raise a family. But on the last day of his life, as his heart was beating slower and slower and slower, there was only one thing for Paul to hang on to. He didn't hang on to a tank. He didn't hang on to a dollar bill. He hung on to his God. He hung on to the only thing that will last forever. Everything else is just an artificial support. I I think of Ephesians chapter 6. Many of you have done some intense studies on the armor of God. And you think about the battles that we have and all of the things that we have to deal with in life. And here in Ephesians 6, put on the armor of God. Good God, what are you going to give us for armor? Are you going to give us shields? Are you going to give us powerful weapons? Give us this armor. Well, here it is. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. Gospel shoes, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. That's the armor of God. That's the indestructible armor of God. Every once in a while you come across an article and there might be one quote in there that grabs you. Michael Horton wrote an article and I don't remember the context of the entire article. I read it, but there was a sentence that stuck with me. Michael Horton writes, church shouldn't be a place where the old self is revived for another week, but where it is killed and buried and the new self is created in the likeness of Christ. That's the armor of God. Every week when we get together and we gather around and open up the Bible, we kill the old self. And the new self, moving toward Christ, is what keeps us going and what will carry us into all eternity. Last verse of Psalm 20. We can live in confident hope. The verse reads like this, O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Uh, Hebrew is an interesting language to try to translate. And sometimes word orders make all the difference. And as I looked at this verse, I'm thinking that I might translate the verse in a little bit more understandable way like this. Save, Lord, May the king answer us when we call. The clear idea of Psalm 20, verse 9, is that God's people can live in confident hope because God answers us when we call out to him. As the apostle Paul was looking at the people that he had surrounded himself with, As he looked at his own people, there was a tragedy that he saw. Paul saw that there was this church of vibrant believers, Jew and Gentile. But as he looked at his fellow Jews, he saw that the vast majority of them had rejected Jesus. As he wrote the the book of Romans, uh, it had been maybe... 25 or 30 years since Christ had been on earth. And he saw that by and large, the Jewish nation had rejected Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, Paul kind of cries out, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Uh, Paul so wanted his people, the Jewish people, to be saved. He wanted them to meet Jesus. And 
as he continued to write to the Romans, he wrote in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Psalm 20 is a psalm that brings us confidence. We can pray. We can stand. We can trust confidently in God. But all of that depends on whether you believe in Jesus Christ. It depends on whether you have ever called out to Jesus to save you. We are separated from God by sin. But the hope of getting to God, the hope of having a relationship with God is 100% in Jesus. And here Paul writes this truth. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called out to God? Have you called out to God to save you through Jesus? That's our hope. That is all our hope. We live in a time in history when people say, well, there's many ways to God. Well, we're people who believe that the Word of God is true, and the Word of God tells us that Jesus is the way. There aren't many ways. Jesus is the way. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have not called out to God to save you through Jesus Christ, call out today. The promise of Romans 10, 13 is true. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you have done that, Psalm 20 is a huge confidence booster for you. As we look ahead, we can pray. We can stand in true trust, not trusting in human resources at all. And we can live in confident hope. God, I pray that